As the Great Depression took hold on the USA, only the very most successful of the previously dominant big bands could stay on the road, and smaller, more club-oriented, three to five piece combos arose, generally with a drummer, a string bass, a pianist who frequently doubled as a vocalist, and increasingly as the 1940s progressed, an electric guitarist. Musically, what were the differences between this new form, which we call rhythm and blues, and rock and roll? Rock and roll dispensed with the shuffle beat which characterised R&B, while rock and roll featured a prominent 4-4 backbeat. R&B used a far broader harmonic palette, which was a hangover from its jazz days, while rock and roll tended to use 1st, 4th, 5th, 7th, or a flat 7th progression usually associated with country music. Vocally, R&B styles relied a lot more on embellishments, melisma, and gospel-derived emotionalism, whereas rock and roll is a lot more straightforward. The new music came to be known in the early 50s as rhythm and blues. The term rock and roll predated it by about a year, thus eliminating the problematic term race music. The music began to emerge in the late 1930s and endured for 20 years before it evolved into what became named as soul music. The initial practitioners were urban vocal groups and the boogie woogie pianists. Albert Ammons, hailing from Chicago, was a fierce and skillful pianist, along with his bestie Mead Lux Lewis, was one of the most influential and charismatic players on the scene. Perhaps, however, the greatest player on the scene, both in a solo and group setting, was Pete Johnson. With Big Joe Turner, he cut Roland Pete in 1938, which is widely touted as an important precursor to rock and roll. Johnson was a fluid and melodically inventive player who, despite being self-taught, had an impressive and expressive technique. The high point for Boogie Woogie was Joe Liggins's The Honey Dripper, which stayed at number one on the R&B charts for 18 weeks, a feat not bested until 2019. Another major factor contributing to R&B were the vocal groups, the Mills Brothers and the Ink Spots, whose slow ballad If I Didn't Care sold just shy of 20 million copies and is still one of the 10 biggest selling records of all time. While not strictly R&B acts acted as key influences, vocal R&B tended to focus on urban lifestyle issues, was generally made for dancing, and incorporated hepcat language, black urban argot, scat, and in some cases, double entendre. Slim and Slam were a popular group. Slim Galliard's humorous vocalese and his clever vocal interplay with Leroy Slam Stewart, who also played the bass. Sam Allen's nimble piano playing held it all together, and they made some nifty little records. No one made more successful small combo R&B records than Lewis Jordan, whose Choo Choo Chiboogi was holder of the record with the Honey Dripper for the most weeks at number one. He was a long time holder of the record for the most number one R&B singles, until Drake, Aretha Franklin and Stevie Wonder passed him. In my opinion, along with Bob Wills, no one can lay better claim to be the godfather of rock and roll. Capable of jazzy blues, the number one hit and top 20 crossover ration blues. Likewise, Ain't That Just Like a Woman, the template for Johnny B. Good, rocking jump blues and like Nat King Cole earned three number one hits on the country charts. Jordan was a profound influence on the course of popular music and quite a jolly fellow with it. Nat King Cole was one of the most popular musicians of all time. So much so that when Capitol built their magnificent proto-googie pile at 1750 Vine Street in Los Angeles, just north of Hollywood Boulevard, they nicknamed it the house that Nat built. A singer, a skillful pianist, a showman and a legitimate movie star, Cole had four crossover number one hits, a country number one and 34 R&B top tens. The R&B hits began to dry up in 1950 as he transitioned to becoming a huge pop star. But the super hip hits from 1942's That Ain't Right to 1950's Orange Coloured Sky were each and all excellent and incredibly effective. 
In the late 1940s and early 50s, small combo R&B began to take a more raw and funky sound for dancing. It became what was known as the Dirty Blues. One of the initial popularisers of the new form was Amos Milburn, a boisterous piano slinger who generally sang up-tempo, good-natured drinking and partying songs. Down the Road a piece and One Bourbon, One Scotch, One Beer became all-time classics and Milburn himself is a key, if somewhat unheralded, figure in the golden age of R&B. Winoni Harris was a lively blues shouter who had 16 R&B top 10s from 1944 to 1952 and stayed a top draw for personal appearances until the late 60s. His cover version of Roy Brown's Good Rockin' Tonight was a huge hit. It also features a great overdriven guitar solo. And while Elvis Presley's second single was modelled more on Brown's version, his hip-swivelling stage act was based, many say, on Harris's, whom he saw live in 1952, and his various gyrations. Speaking of Presley, he once said, if I had any ambition, it was to be as good as Arthur Crudup. If not as commercially successful, Crudup's records such as That's Alright Mama, My Baby Left Me, Rock Me Mama and Who's Been Foolin' You form a bridge between the Delta Blues, Chicago Blues and wild uninhibited R&B. Everyone with any kind of serious interest in Western popular music knows the name of Arthur Big Boy Crudup. It's a great shame that everybody knows him because someone else sang one of his songs. Lastly, and sadly leastly, there's Stick McGee, who only had two hits, but what great and important records they were. Drink and Wine Spodiote from 1949 draws the line between what was then R&B and what Alan Freed, a Cleveland, Ohio disc jockey, was to drop rock and roll in 1951. Its cred as the first ever rock and roll record is reinforced by the fact that the first country music version was released in 1949, seven months after McGee's version, by Lloyd Gordon and his Pleasant Valley Boys. And while there were hundreds of similar contemporary records, this one is important because it saved Atlantic Records then a scuffling indie label from the impending financial ruin. McGee did have one other hit, the nifty One Monkey Won't Stop No Show. From then on though, it was a descent into obscurity before his death from lung cancer in 1961. McGee's success in 1949 was a precursor to the rise of Atlantic as the premier R&B label in the land. This was cemented when they signed and began having hits with the woman known as the Queen of R&B the inimitable Ruth Brown. Capable of moving from full-on belters to a more sophisticated uptown urban style, Brown had 22 R&B top 10 hits, eight of which crossed over to the Pop Hot 100. Retiring in the early 60s to raise her family, Brown came back in the late 60s and transitioned from recording act to actress, showing a deft comedic touch. She spent a final years leading the campaign to pay royalties to performers like Arthur Crudup, who were never paid for their work. Atlantic's next hit machine was The Clovers, who had 19 R&B top 10s, and after leaving Atlantic in 1958, hit number 23 on the pop charts with the original Love Potion number 9. Basically a souped up doo-wop group with a penchant for swapping lead vocalists, three of whom were drafted into the army, the Clovers were well served by sympathetic songwriters like Rudy Toombs, Lever and Stoller and Armand Erdogan himself. And hits like One Mint Julep, Devil or Angel and Your Cash Ain't Nothing But Trash are classics of the genre. Finally, we come to the jewel in the crown of Atlantic's R&B catalogue, The Drifters. The group used two lead vocalists in the R&B era, most famous of whom was the great Clyde McFatter formerly a member of Billy Ward and the Dominoes, around whom Armand Erdogan assembled a group as backing singers, who sang on such hits as Money Honey, Honey Love and Such a Night. McFadden was drafted in 1954, but because he was stationed near New York City, he could still make sessions. He quit the group and went solo to middling success in 1955 before MCA signed him for a $100,000 advance. There's some debate as to whether McFatter or Ray Charles was the first black artist 
to hold the distinction of a $100,000 advance. He managed precisely one middling hit and they dropped him like a soggy marmoset. And he moved to Mercury where he had a solid hit with Lover Please, but obscurity and alcoholism had set in by the time of his death at age 34 in 1972. Interviews showing him to be an embittered man who was at a loss to understand where his fans, sales and money had gone. And thus we tell the story of the early influences of rhythm and blues. In our next instalment, we'll look at the other side of the coin and try to define what exactly was rockabilly. I look forward to your company.